grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today is a little bit of a special festival in the church year. You may have noticed that we switched back from green pyramids to white for this week. Today is the Nativity of St. John the Baptist. Ordinarily, this festival is not observed unless it actually falls on a Sunday, as it does this year, today, Sunday, June 24th. Today is exactly six months away from Christmas Eve. So you could start your, your shopping now, I suppose, if you like to plan ahead. Why, why six months from Christmas Eve? Well, this day was chosen because when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, after the angel Gabriel tells her that she is pregnant with our Lord, Luke tells us that Elizabeth was in her sixth month of pregnancy. So if you do the math, John is about six months older than Jesus, which is why we observe his birth on this day. But why do we observe his birth? That is really the question. John the Baptist is familiar to all of us. Readings about his, his life and, and his work come up regularly in the course of the church year, year after year. We hear every Advent about his baptizing in the Jordan River and his call of repentance, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Most of us even know a little bit about his wardrobe and his diet, how he wore a cloak of camel's hair and he subsisted on a steady diet of locusts and wild honey as he lived out in the wilderness. And who among us is not at least a little bit familiar with the circumstances of his death? How he had criticized Herod for Herod's unlawful marriage to his divorced sister-in-law, Herodias, whose daughter, Salome, so pleased Herod on his birthday by dancing for him that he gave her John the Baptist's head on a platter. John is well known for all of those things and more, but who was John really? Where did he fit into the story? Where does he fit into the story of Jesus Christ? The answer to that question is given by God himself, already at John's birth. John was no ordinary child. He was born the only son of parents so old that no one would have ever expected them to have a baby. Gabriel had announced to John's father, Zechariah, while he was in the temple, that his wife would bear a child, and he didn't believe it. And as a result, God caused him to become mute until the day that John was born. We pick up the narrative with our gospel reading for today. Well, despite Zechariah's incredulity, Elizabeth did conceive, and she gave birth to a son, just as God had foretold through the angel. Her neighbors and her relatives rejoice with her, and they show up to his party for his circumcision, where his name would finally be revealed. They want to call him Zechariah, but God had given him a different name, John. Like many people in the scriptures, John's name is significant. It's full of meaning. The, word, the name John means God has shown favor. This is who John the Baptist was. This is how he fit into the grand story of salvation of Jesus Christ. John spoke God's word. He called to repentance, but he was no ordinary prophet. He was the prophet who was sent to prepare the way for the time of God's favor, for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's important about John is not his bizarre desert asceticism, nor his courageous, faithful witness to God's word on marriage, what is most important about John the Baptist is his role in God's gracious visitation. John was no ordinary prophet. He was sent to prepare God's people for the time of God's favor. And Zechariah recognized that at his birth through the song that he sang. When he had finally been given a writing tablet and he 
scrawled out, his name is John, God opened Zechariah's lips to burst forth into singing. He sang of God's redemption by his servant David, whom God had long promised to his people through the prophets. And he sang even of his own son's role in this grand story. Saying of John, Zechariah sang, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sun shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. John is the one that God sends to prepare his people for Jesus. John's words awoke people to their sins. John's words killed. His message of repentance brought many people down to the river Jordan to drown their sins in baptism. His words made alive, too. He told them of the one coming after him who is mightier than him, who strapped of of his sandals, he was not even worthy to stoop down and untie. And that this mighty one would be the one who would save them from their sins. And those who heard John's words came out of the water waiting for their Lord. For then and only then were they ready to see Jesus. You see, when you come to Jesus as a lost and condemned sinner, only then will you see Jesus for who he truly is. Only when you've been crushed by the messenger of repentance are you ready to hear the message of grace. When you know that your sin has destroyed you, then and only then can you hear about the one who has died to redeem you and raise you up again. If you come to Jesus in any other way than as a sinner in need of his mercy, you miss Jesus. You miss the entire point of his work. And that's why God sent John. God doesn't want Jesus to be missed. God doesn't want his time of favor to be missed, so he sends John. John is another example of how God worked everything together to bring this message of salvation to his people. First, he sent John the Baptist to prepare the way by preaching repentance and faith in the one who would come. And then he sent Jesus to bring his mercy and life and salvation to those who are waiting. Today, we give thanks to God for sending John to prepare us for Christ's work. But we also give thanks to God for the many other messengers he has sent to us. Messengers of preparation. Who are these messengers of preparation that God has sent to you? Well, when you were born, God sent you your parents who already from birth were preparing you for the gospel. Their work of preparation was to bring you to the baptism font where you heard Jesus speak his word of forgiveness to you. As messengers of preparation, they probably also chose sponsors for you who would serve as co-messengers, as God's servants to continue to point you back to Jesus, who has redeemed you from all of your sin. Messengers of preparation were sent to you in your days of Sunday school as and confirmation instruction when dozens of faithful Christian witnesses open to you the scriptures. And as they open to you the scriptures, they prepared you to meet Jesus, to whom all of the scriptures point in his death and resurrection for your sins. You probably know a number of other individuals in your life as well whom God has used as messengers of preparation at other times. 
Christians who by their words and deeds encouraged you and pointed you away from yourself and towards our Savior. Maybe it's sometimes even been people you haven't even met, books you've read, sermons you've watched online, stories you've heard. There's at least a couple dozen other messengers of preparation you hear all the time. God sends to you all the time. For when you come to this church, you come into a congregation full of messengers. As they sing their hymns of praise, their words uncover to you the horror of your sin, but they also show you the mercy of Christ our Savior. As they confess their faith with you, they confess also to you that there is salvation for you in our Lord Jesus Christ. When we hear all of these many messengers of preparation, we know that God is at work to bring us back to him, just as he sent his servant John the Baptist to prepare his people to meet their Savior. We give thanks to God that he uses these many instruments to point us to his Son. And in giving thanks to God, we can sing Zechariah's song of praise with gusto, knowing that what he speaks is true for us as well. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We rise for the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty.